Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here in this afternoon. Welcome to the Make a Scene Festival. <laughs> it's the 20th year of the Hip Hop House, so uh, it's a very special festival this year. Um, and I'm very excited about this afternoon. Um, I am so happy that Jonathan made it to the Netherlands. It's his first time here. So I said, yes, there is black people here. So I said, there, a lot of them are in Rotterdam. So come through. So I'm very excited that everybody showed up and showed out. Um, there's a few things that um, I want to talk about today with Jonathan that we'll get into. Um, but first of all, I want you to um, understand that what brings us together today is that next week, it's July 1st, which is the uh, abolishment and celebration of 1863. Um, uh, July 1st, 1863, the abolishment of slavery. And um, so uh, my sister and I at Kip Republic um, are organizing this event where we hand out a few meals of Hir Hiri um, throughout the country. Um, this year, it's only 20,000 meals. Um, in Rotterdam, there are like seven locations where you can pick up a meal. Uh, Hip Hop House is one of them. Melly is one of them. Te Air is one of them. So make sure, make sure you pick up your Hir Hiri meal and uh, commemorate and celebrate our history. Um, so that is what brings us here today, is that we wanted to do a program around Free Hir Hiri, around Make a Scene, and around blackity blackness. <laughs> so that said, um, I want to share a little bit of story about Jonathan McCory. So as some of you may know, I moved to New York in 2004. So that's about 16 years ago. And after going to school, um, there was this director's lab at Lincoln Center that I entered and I met a couple of amazing directors and one person was like, oh, you should meet Jonathan McCory. And I was like, oh, sure, cool. Uh, let's do this brunch. So we did this brunch. I go to this brunch and Jonathan is there. And we meet each other and we're like, hey, oh, cool. Nice to meet you. This is so great. He said, um, yeah, I'm the artistic director of the National Black Theater. And I said, how old are you? And he said, 25. And I'm like, what? Okay, I'll meet you there tomorrow. So uh, the next day, I go to the National Black Theater on 125th Street in Harlem, and it was also my first day at work because I knew this was going to be the place that I would be working at. So I walked in, and there's boxes everywhere, and Jonathan is sitting in this corner right to, next to this meditation space, uh, sitting behind a desk, and I said, what can I do? So we started unpacking boxes, and three years later, um, we created amazing programming at the National Black Theater. I walk up to, walked up to him and the CEO of the National Black Theater, Shade Litka, and I said, well, you know, I think I should be the uh, director of international programming. And they were like, sure. And next thing you know, Samora Bergtop came from the Netherlands to become part of the National Black Theater, and it's our home away from home. So um, with uh, no further ado, please welcome the amazing, talented, beautiful spirit, Jonathan McCory. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's do this. Hey, everybody. Hey. Such a blessing to be here. So you just landed. You're in the Netherlands for the first time. How are you feeling? I mean, I, I, what, I, what, I said, what I said is that it's like a beautiful breath of fresh air. Um, the way in which uh, Rotterdam, in particular, uh, harnesses the urban culture with nature. Um, the way that nature is integrated into the structure of this uh, architectural design actually allows for possibility to show up of how humanity can live with nature versus humanity imp imposing itself on nature. Um, coming from New York, concrete jungle, um, there isn't that kind of homogeny, right? That kind of, that kind of harmony 
Um, and like to see that, to witness that, and to feel the freshness of this air. I, again, I don't know all the history that comes with that freshness of the air that I'm breathing, right? <laughs> but I do get to experience a freshness. And to experience that freshness creates a space of possibility. So yeah. I would say that's what it's been in the first 24 hours. Yes, wait till you come to Amsterdam. <laughs> 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 so um, before we start uh, the conversation, I feel like we need to address what's going on in yes. the United States. Um, yesterday, uh, Roe versus Wade was overturned. Um, for those of you that don't know the abortion law that was put into place many decades ago was overturned yesterday. Um, I just want to know where are you sitting with what's going on in the country right now? What is happening currently is a reminder, A, at first my initial reaction was, it sucks to be an American. Mm. Um, uh, that America is having, it, it, that, that to be human in, American, in America, no, regardless of your sexual orientation, regardless of your race, regardless of your class, regardless of all the constructs that we label, um, America forces humans to be resilient and have a resistance and have a um, always feel like they have to go up, go up against a structure. Um, and so for me, that's sadness, because then how do you learn how to breathe? Yeah. You're always breathing with a presence of oppression being put on your back versus breathing with a possibility of what does liberation truly look like? And you're fighting for your liberation versus just owning it as a birthright, right? Um, so there's a sadness that comes with that mm -hmm. um, because that means that there's a mantle and a fire that now has to live inside of the very vessel of every being who walks on that planet, who walks in America, right? Um, that, that there is now this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of mm, everyone feels like they know everything now. Mm. And if I look on the Instagram, everyone's telling me something that I need to know um, versus, and the idea of everyone now, because of so, how social media is structured and how movements are structured, everyone gets to be a leader, which is powerful, but also can be distracted. Right. Um, because then you're, because the who is feeding the information becomes kind of desperate. Instead of being able, I think there was structure in, in the homogeny of what happened with the civil rights movement. When you had a Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X, um, and you have people like Byron Rustin feeding into that movement, right? Not that he was not, and then, and then we learn about his power, where he came from, and who, like, you know what I mean? All the people who were behind the singular voice. Um, and I also think about what, is it, what, what, does, what does the future hold for black women um, and black womanhood? Um, I think about how, how that statement still rings true until the black woman is free, and I think now the black trans woman is free. We are not, we are not all liberated. And I, think about, I, and, I th and I think about how that body is still being built on, and it, there's an industry being built on that body. Yeah. Um, and their expectation of what that body will produce for the capitalistic system that is America. Because the way in which that some of the equations being brought up is that if you take away this right, you have an essence of overpopulation and you think about who is overpopulating, they're thinking ahead of who they want to overpopulate, and then they think about the system in which they make money over that, on that overpopulated body, which is that maybe crime will show up. If crime shows up, then I have the prison system. The prison system is where I make the most amount of money off of these bodies. So then I have a new form of slavery showing up um, that actually is lawful. That we haven't that, that we still haven't gotten so so like there's a lot of there's a lot that i sit with when i when i like and that's been in the past 24 hours since that's shown up it's just like how does and then i also ask myself as a cultural curator as a person who is a gatekeeper i do not deny the fact that as being the executive artistic director of national black theater doesn't make me a gatekeeper i actually say that is important for me to name because it's important for me to uplift that because now I have to do my due diligence to make sure the gate is wide open, not closed. And so a part of my language is like, so then what am I doing curatorially to address the systemic issues that produce the reckoning for that to be destruct, like, like taken out, right? I thought, I thought, about, that, I thought about that with Mike, with, with Mike Brown. I mean, not with George Floyd, right? I know we're going on no, to another tangent. But, but the George Floyd moment made me actually have a conversation with myself saying, in what ways am I create, in what ways have I done anti-blackness, right? I might not be racist. I don't think there's a way for my body to be racist, but there's a way for my body to produce anti-blackness. 
And by producing anti-blackness, I create the conditions for George Floyd to show up. So in what ways, in my actions, in my doing, in my curatorial eye, in the way in which I accept people and don't accept people, the way I say hello to people, the way I don't say hello to people, have I produced a psychology that allows for a nation to put the knee on somebody and also produce a psychology that will allow for, for jurors who don't identify as the person with the body to destruct and distract our, the, the ownership the autonomy that someone should have the choice over. And so, and so my question is like, how do I do, how do, I do my job better? Yeah. My job is not done. And I think my quest as a, as a cultural curator, as a gatekeeper, as all of those things, is, is, is to have a conversation with the very vibration of, I do, my job is not done, the work of the National Black Theater is not done, until we have eradicated the sensibility of um, someone not feeling liberated and having liberated breath. That my job is to make sure, oh, should I shut up? Should I be quiet? <laughs> that, that, my, that, my, that my job my job is to make sure that the very vibration of anyone who's in the room with me, anyone who's in space with me, anyone who gets to have a conversation with the art that I get to curate, that I get the privilege to put breath into, that it brings breath, a liberated breath inside the bodies and vessels of everyone who's sitting. Because if we create that mechanism, Possibility, again, talking about the air here, possibility shows up. By possibility showing up, we start to have a conversation about being human, not being black, not being rich or poor or being poverty, human. Because all those constructs were divisive forces to make sure the capitalistic system, which we all are products of, we all are having different relationships with, lives, vital, is present. So that's what happened. <laughs> See, this is why I only have three questions <laughs> today. Do you think we're leaderless or leaderful? So I think what's really powerful about what happened with the, with, with, with the pandemic is that it actually asked us to actually be CEOs of our own destiny. It actually asked us to say, who, how, how, do I, how do I not uh, look to, how do I actually have a conversation with myself, right? How do I sit with myself, own myself, have love with myself, and actually begin to have so much love with myself that I get to extend it with others. Now, some people did not actually take the opportunity to have that self-analysis, so then now they're walking into this world as a zombie, right? There are other people who actually took the opportunity to actually sit with self and actually clean the self and actually purify the self to actually have a conversation with 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 the destiny that this planet actually needs us to be in right then then this is actually growth like right? oh am i the, uh, is... so, the, so 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 the question so the, so the so the question now the question now that i actually sit with inside of um coming out of the shutdown not the pandemic because we're still in the midst of it right coming out of the shutdown is who took the opportunity to have a self-assessment and who did not who took the opportunity to be on vacation and who took the opportunity to transformation who took the opportunity to fall in love with themselves like and who took the opportunity to fall in love with like their their richness their op their their opulence their the image of themselves right so so like so like there there's this beautiful quote that i'm wearing which is dr barbara and tears quote which is where there is love there is no fear um and so then I asked myself, how are we vessels of love in this moment? And we could be leaders. See, this is where I think the social media thing, I have a love-hate relationship with like, I, I don't think that what happened with the civil rights movement and having a singular leader was smart. Mm -hmm. But I also don't think that having a thousand leaders uh, telling us everything and trying to guide is, the right, is, is a movement built right. on either. Right. Um, we haven't, there, there is this narcissistic vein that lives inside of the human psyche that doesn't actually allow for us to be democratized in our true and, and actually be in community with each other. Um, someone has to be uplifted as singular. Something singular has to be uplifted. Um, and so I, I, think, I, think, I think until we address our narcissism, um, will we then begin to have a true conversation with progress? Yeah, and I also think not just address our narcissism, but I also feel like we haven't figured out the tools or the language yet of how can we function in collective leadership? Yeah, because the function in collective leadership means that you have to let, let, be abolishing your own ego. Exactly, right. And do, you actually, and do you actually love yourself enough not to have to be full of ego? Like, do I have to tear you down in order to love myself? Like, do I have to say that you're, like, do I have to put shit on you in order for my shit to shine, right? Because right. I still shit, but I just want my shit to shiny? <laughs> like, 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 what are we doing here? Like, what are we actually, what are we actually producing here? Like, like when we actually think about when we actually think about the kind of for 
for people of African American descent, the kind of the kind of erasure that white plantation owners had to have to not hear the cries of people being whipped and think that that was joyful. The actual notion of, we were just talking about this idea of picnic, right? And how picnic comes from this language of picking a nigga and watching a nigga hang, right? That that was considered a gathering of, 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 of love for a community of people to watch someone hang and dangle while they ate food and dined. Mm -hmm. That that we that 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 we have that we that this is this is the foundation in which we start talking about progress. This is the foundation when we start talking about the people who have billions of dollars right now. Their wealth is steeped off of the tyranny, the destruction, the capitalization, the oppression, the configuration of other people not having, and them loving that to the finest of the finest critique. So then when they start, so and then, and then we have this other conversation of, then they get to destroy this planet and start to go somewhere else, while the ones who are not able to, we are left to do what? Suffer, die, live, in, live, live without? Like, you know, there was this beautiful movie, I'm going on a tangent, but there's this beautiful movie on, um, on um, Don't Look Up. I don't know if anyone got to see it during the pandemic. And there's, it's a really bad movie, but the beautiful moment around the movie that I love is the moment when the comet comes to planet Earth. And when they all have a family dinner, and they know the end is coming, but they show up with love. And the deepest sense of love shows up because they don't actually care who slept with who, 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 who stabbed who, who didn't give money to who. They don't care about none of that. They get to be human for a moment. And I just wonder, do we need that kind of destruction in order to get human? Right. When can we just do that? And not, and not have to be like, oh, if I don't get human right now, I'll never know my own humanity. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking um, almost we find ourselves in a space of you have to destruct to rebuild again. Ooh, I like that. Uh, but I'm also thinking, and we'll get to um, the National Black Theater and more in depth of Dr. Barbara Antier's sure. mission and vision and how she wanted to build this space in New York. Um, I wanted to, I want to know about your story. Who is this guy? What are you about to do? Ah, <laughs> the family photo. Yes. No, you did not. I sure did. I didn't, and I haven't even pulled out the government name yet. No, and you shouldn't. <laughs> no, joking, joking, joking. No, because as you're speaking, there's history, legacy that you stand on. So I want you to speak a little bit about, tell me about these people and where you come from. Uh, Washington. Washington DC is where you were born. Yeah, so I was born. I was born and raised in Washington DC in the Diamond. Um, uh, I got. I got. A, and I, I. I. I like to utilize that phrase in the Diamond for multiple different reasons. I'm infatuated with diamonds, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, I grew up in Washington DC, Northwest. Um, I uh, was in this family photo. Is my sister, um, my mom, my dad who who passed away Jan in January, and my grandmother who passed away in December. Um, and they both are now my ancestors. Um, but in this photo is one of, is like my sister's favorite photo of us. Um, it's a capture in a moment in time when we were just, just there was, there was a kind of tranquility. So it's really beautiful that you picked up on that because I sent you a lot of pictures, but you picked up on that one. Um, um, the, the, the family that I grew up, the time I got to grow up in DC is when DC was black. I got to grow up in black DC. I got to grow up in Chocolate City, not milk chocolate, which is what you have right now, not white chocolate, which you can probably experience now. I grew up in black, black, blackity black DC. And I think that what's important to name in that is that I got to know what it looked like to be a black um, philanthropist. I also got to know what it meant to be a black neighbor. I also got to know what black poverty looked like. I also got to know what black um, politics looked like. I also got to know what black opulence looked like. I got to know what blackness looked like in the, in the, in the spectrum of all that is black. Um, and that was kind of, and, that, and, that, and I think that helped to be the foundation where I'm as malleable as I am. Um, because I bobbed and weave, I can bob and weave in different circles in my witnessing because of how my parents raised me um, and uh, and in and in and and in that and in that I got to like I got to my grandmother who who moved to DC from Cincinnati um, her her great great grandfather was the first black senator of Cincinnati um, helped to build the community in Cincinnati and actually was an architect and actually architected the, uh, his signatures on the design for the for the first and first 
black Pris Episcopal Church, Cathedral Church, mm -hmm. in the black neighborhood in Cincinnati. Um, and my grandmother, who she would be considered a blue blood, really hated wealth. So she denounced all of her all of her wealth and moved to and moved to um, and moved to D.C. Um, by herself. All her family had died from smallpox, um, and she was by herself. Um, and I think what's important to name in that is that my grandmother redefined herself in that moment, um, and my grandmother built a community for me and my family to like get to know. She was adopted by um, uh, my grandmother, who is in the center. Um, she was adopted by a family called the Barber Bowling Family. Um, they would become my aunts and my uncles and people who I got to adore. But they all were they all were doing the damn thing as black folks, right? My grandma, my grandmother became the head of social work at Howard University, and so her her group became the top neurosurgeon at Howard University. Her group became like that kind of like you know psychology stuff like that. So I got to grow up knowing, and all these people were black. All these people were people who identify as part of the African tradition. Um, and they got, they would humble, they humbled me, they humbled my, like my mom has this beautiful story of her godmother, Shirley, um, who bought her a mink coat, a white mink coat, and said, this is for you, and then threw it on the ground and stomped on it and said, it means nothing. This mink means nothing. Wealth means nothing unless you're a good person. Mm -hmm. And so, like this is like I, again, this is like the kind of some of the found some of the makeup. Right. So, 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 so I say all that story. And so then I went to Duke Ellington School of the Arts, which is a arts performing arts school in Washington D.C. Um, I studied. I was the first and last class of the musical theater department. So I studied musical theater as my foundation. Um, that was by accident um, because why? Because I have ADD, dyslexia, and another form of uh, mental whatever. I was told I was never going to be able to go to college. Right. There you go again. So I was told I was I was told I was never going to be able to go to college, um, and um, that my parents should basically prepare to like always take care of me because I wasn't going to be academically an adept to be able to handle and be with my peers. What's important to say in that is that when I tried to go to high school, I couldn't get into any any private high school because of my learning disability. They wouldn't. They didn't think I was going to be able to keep up. So I applied to twelve private high schools. Did not get into any of them. Um, and then um, before I could be be like flooded into a magnum school, which I would be one of three hundred in my class. My fam my family knew I would probably fail at that. Um, someone said, "He you sing. He dances. He does some things. Why don't you just have him apply for Duke Ellington School of the Arts?" So I applied. I made it into the. Uh, I was the last to get accepted into the voice department there. Um, so I was the last male to get accepted in the voice department, and they were starting a musical theater department, and I applied for that, and I made it in. So I say all that to say is that my curiosity has been my saving grace, um, me being curious when many things said no. Um, and at Duke Ellington, I, I also got to, that's where I also got steeped even deeper inside my blackness as a black artist. I had all black teachers. Um, uh, for dance, for, for music, for acting. Um, and the beautiful thing that what that taught me, that's when I started to learn what it meant to operate a theater. Um, so I got to be a house manager and usher. They, the actual school started paying me, I was so good. It felt really good to get a check in high school. Um, uh, so I, got, so, so I, I became a house manager there. And then um, on top of that, on top of that, I got to also understand some of the practicalities. So I also became a stage manager, a line designer, and stuff like that while at Duke Ellington. Um, and when my junior year of high school, um, the chair of my theater department said, hey, Jonathan, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, well, um, I want to go to NYU. I want to study musical theater. I hadn't, gotten, I didn't, hadn't applied to NYU yet. So who knew if I was going to make it in? But I said, that's what I want to do. And then I said, ultimately, I want to run a theater in Harlem that owns their own space dedicated to doing black work. I want to be an artistic director in Harlem. And he said, that's very specific. He said, uh, <laughs> uh, when do you plan on doing that? I said, well, you know, I'll be 40 when that happens. And then I said, also, on top of that, I want to reestablish re the birthright for black artists. Um, if people know of the Negro Ensemble, the Negro Ensemble was known as the number one black theater in America at one point in time, it, with a budget of two point, I think two point three million dollars in like 19, 19, 1980 or nineteen seventy something like that. So like they were they were doing the damn thing, right? And they had a space, and they lost it. They lost it all. It crumbled really fast. Um, and for me as a black artist, when I claimed to be one, that was my birthright and it wasn't managed, and it was my inheritance. 
and I wanted to, exactly, I wanted to reestablish my inheritance. That was important. That was important for me to do for other black artists. So, <laughs> so, that, so, that, so, that, so that's a little bit about how I got to New York. New York, and then you made it to New York, and you get into NYU, and you graduate at NYU, and then you meet Shade Lithcott. Yeah, the, so the Shade, so the so the meaning of Shade Lithcott. And, and, and tell us about who Shade is. I'll tell you about who Shade is, yes. and I'll tell you how I meet Shade Lithcott. Oh wow, you got a whole piece. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, a whole. Yeah. I ain't, I don't know what the slides look like, y'all. So when they come out, I'm like, oh, that's what I'm talking about. So so um, so Shade. So how do I meet Shade Lithcott? I was directing. I founded two theater. I founded two theater companies while in while in New York. Um, from my graduation, I founded the Movement Theater Company, and then I also founded Harlem Nine. The Movement Theater Company was a company uh, of black artists coming out of NYU who are just tired of being coons and being drug addicts and being robbers. And we were just like, we were trained to be better than that. So let's come together and do something different. So we created the Movement Theater Company. And then the Harlem Nine was a group of black producers, nine black producers saying, what does it look like to have shared resources and share economics as, as producers? So we ba ra rallied together and we created Harlem Nine. We created this festival called 48 Hours in Harlem. Ida has actually been an artist in 48 Eight hours at Harlem um, and uh, the festival is we bring 30 artists together over the course of a weekend they create six plays they memorize the six plays and then with six uh, with six uh, uh, three actors and then a playwright writes a brand new play in 24 hours um, a director has to stage it in eight hours and then an actor has to memorize it in 72 hours and with one performance um, and we've done it for about we, this is about our 12th year. We got, a, we got an award from it, but we have, we've uh, basically helped to support um, the creation, and we now publish the plays. So we have about 12 anthologies that we've been able to diversify the opportunity of, of what black plays can look like and how black playwriting can look like. And they're 10 minutes short, so it allows for also, if someone wants to do scene work inside of their uh, schools, um, actors have access to new content instead of feeling like they always have to do August Wilson or they always have to do piano lesson. Um, and hopefully it gives them an opportunity to have new content to play with. Um, so how does Sade come into, how do I meet Sade? I meet Sade through a mutual friend, um, a very, a very beautiful art, artist by the name of uh, Michelle Shea. Uh, Michelle Shea, who is a venerated um, artist, uh, also was one of the first black women to be on a soap opera. Um, she, she comes to see a show that I directed called Black in the Bubble, and she, she's another spiritual gumbo yaya channeling vessel. And she says, I don't know, but Spirit's telling me you need to meet Shade Lithcott. I said, okay, I've never, I, I don't remember. And then she's like, oh, do you know the National Black Theater? I was like, yeah, I kind of know National Black Theater. Yeah, I know about them. She's like, well, Spirit's telling me the two of y'all need to meet. Can I make an introduction? And I said, oh, okay, well, let's make an introduction. I don't deny Spirit. So like, whatever you say, you my, God, you my spiritual godmother, my theatrical godmother. If you say go, I say where. Okay, so, so, then, so then she writes this email and I try to get Shade to come to the production. I'm like, hey, why don't you come see my show? I'm 24 at the time. I'm like, come on, come see my show. Because in my mind, I'm just like, can't you just transfer my show? Like, come on, let's just transfer my show. Give a brother a hookup, mama. <laughs> so, 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 so I'm trying to get Shade to come see my show. She's not giving me any time of day because I'm 24 and she's like, who are you, you young child? And so she doesn't see my show at all. Totally not, doesn't come. Then we have, so instead of that, I say, oh, let's just have tea. So we have T um, about 10 years ago, and I've never left, we've never left each other side ever since. since. We've been connected to the hip ever since. We've been dreaming and building ever since. Um, she, had never, she had never seen any of my work before she hired me as, um, at first it was the director of theater arts programming, then it transitioned to artistic director, and now it's executive artistic director of the National Black Theater. Um, I never met her mother, but she feels like I know her mother, and I was trained by her mother. Um, her mother being Dr. Barbara Antier. So Shade Lithcott is the daughter of Dr. Barbara Antier, who's the founder of the National Black Theater. Um, Shade Lithcott is the CEO of MBT. Um, she is a spiritually grounded, guided, beautiful vessel. Um, who has who has um, has a versatile of a career, but deeply deeply committed to not only her people but uplifting her mother's vision. 
and making sure that her mother's vision is not only remembered, but is amplified, rooted, and then now propelled for the future. Um, and her mother, wh Let's who look is at right her here. Real quick. Oh, so Black theater comes from a context of transformation. We're in the business of transformation. Our purpose is to transform the experience of theater into a celebration of life. We've existed for 14 and a half years on this corner of Fifth. 25th Street. We have four full-time programs. We have a children's school, which is holistic uh, in its approach. We have a performing program, a touring program, which is our outreach program, and we have educational and performance workshops. So the first thing we did when we came to Harlem was to discovered that there was nothing written about it. There were no books, there were no uh, films, there were no, there was nothing, you know. People say in the church that, I don't know, I just feel it, or the, you know, God came down, I don't know. They don't know, they don't know the science of it. So I said, okay, I wanna create the, uh, the, the process that causes a, for an Aretha, or for Malcolm X, or for Martin Luther King, those preacher rhythms of James Cleveland. I want to to uh, put that into a formula, into a science, so that people can experience uh, the, the black experience. We wanted to create out of our own experience, our own lifestyle, a concept of theater that would fit our sensibilities, you know? Well, and when I say black theater, I'm talking about changing the total thrust of Western theater without a, um, a color on it. See, black used to be a, a um, you know, you thought of blackness as a, a skin color. And then we went through that phase and then the definition was a state of mind. But we're saying now that blackness is the unleashing of a overwhelming creative force. of a force. When you think of um, black liberation in service of human transformation, what do you think of? I mean, the first thing that I think of is our theory of change. So we have a theory of change, um, uh, which is black liberation plus art plus placemaking equals a space for human transformation. That we're in the service of human transformation, but first we have to know how black people are liberated in order to get there. And that has to also mean that the art has to be guided by that, but then also the space has to, has to give the permission for that to happen. And sometimes that permission has to be taken, but sometimes that permission needs to be just granted, right? right. There's multiple different ways of how space can uh, contribute to that. Um, and that we're trying to create a space so that everyone, regardless of how you identify, and regardless of how you see yourselves, are transformed. So humanity, going back to that human vibration. Right. Um, I, also think, I also think of the wisdom, I mean, the picture that you showed a little bit before was the day that Dr. Barbara Antier bought a city block. So um, 34 years ago, close to 40 years ago, Dr. Barbara Antier bought 62,000 square feet of real estate. She bought the corner of 125th Street and 5th Avenue. Um, at that moment, it was a million dollars. Um, and uh, she w by doing that, generating the autonomy for National Black Theater to have a permanent home, that would definitely, that would help it to never have to think about or ever consider um, being displaced. Um, so that space, um, is our home away from home. Um, how did she get it? Um, though, well, half of it was a jewelry factory, and then the other half got burnt down by an uh, alarm fire. It was a fire where the Kentucky Fried Chicken, the grease from Kentucky Fried Chicken, met the chemicals from a cleaner. Um, so it would be chicken and a cleaner. Um, actually burnt down, <laughs> burnt down, burnt down half of the building. Um, and the owner was gonna sell it and sell it to her for a million dollars. So. So Dr. Barbara Antier really, really was able to ground herself inside of that idea of really wanting to create a little, um, she had been studying um, Nigeria culture and particularly Yoruba. Um, she had been going to um, Yoruba land for I would say seven or eight years on a cycle and she found that to be her home. Um, and so she wanted to create uh, National Black Theater to be an extension of that home. So she brought seven Nigerian artists over, and um, because of that, they carved out the largest collection of new sacred art in the Western Hemisphere. So we have the largest collection, a part of, a part of the building, um, and why? Um, Dr. Tier be believed, just like when everyone walked in here, the algorithm of them changed when they saw the grass. Dr. Tier believed that everything had a vibration. 
um, and that art in particular had a vibration, and that if you welcomed people with a certain um, matrix, that they would then, uh, they would then um, have a shifting, a transformative uh, conversation with self. Um, so our, our, the art, that work that is around the building, the, f the fountains that are around the building, um, the art that's on our stage is all intended to begin a conversation from the moment you walk through the door um, and that we are not trying to have a transactional experience with you, we're trying to have a transformational experience with you um, and have you fall, as Dr. Tier would say, fall in love with yourself. Um, learn to love yourself more and more. I want to open it up to the audience and actually ask the audience, do you know if there's a space like this or do you experience a space like this here in the Netherlands? A space or a project or is there an artist that you feel like is rooted in these values? When you think of our sector, our cultural sector, any spaces that you can think of? Yolanda? It's a moving space. Thank you. I would say that that space is a moving space, that it's a space that when people come together, that that vibration is created. And I wouldn't say that there is one, I mean, there are several tangible spaces that kind of evoke this vibration. But I also believe that it, in, in the Netherlands, from what I believe, it's very dominant when the people come together because when I entered this room, I was like, hey, hey, and you're from Amsterdam and Rotterdam, but we all know each other. And so this connection, I feel like that's, that's the space. We make the space when we get together. Yeah. So. Jennifer? Absolutely agree with both say, and I think it also has to do with who organizes it. Because um, it, these are the simple things, right? Indeed, going where you are and meeting those people, but also like, uh, a free heheri and the people they work with. Uh, going to hip hop house and knowing that if I go there, I will get greeted, I will get food, I will be home. You know, so I think it also has to do with who's organizing it and you have a few key figures in the Netherlands that are doing that and that goes across cities. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. Anybody else? Any other space? And so, yeah, Shiri? Oh. Onze situatie in uh, Nederland is een andere dan in de US. De financiering van de kunsten. En heel veel van de financiering van de kunsten gaat hier door de overheid. En wij kennen in Nederland, hebben wij geen vrije ruimte zoals die ruimte. Die niet afhankelijk is van overheidsfinanciering. So let me this translate that real quick. So he's saying that in the Netherlands there's a different system. A lot of spaces function through government funding. And therefore, the dynamics are different. In het verleden zijn een aantal gezelschappen geweest die door of de zwarte mensen zijn opgericht, of later door zwarte mensen zijn geleid worden. En nu zijn het er veel meer geworden. Maar het is altijd een, een wankel evenwicht. Omdat je afhankelijk bent van overheidsfinanciering. En je nooit zeker bent dat die plek altijd door een zwart iemand geleid gaat worden. Dus hij zegt, je bent nooit zeker 
if um, you're going to be able to get funded or keep your resources and therefore are sure that it's run by a person of color. So that is an... So it's a different is, system is actually... Yeah, that is where we nu in Nederland staan. Gelukkig gewijs hebben wij, net als Jolanda die net sprak, zijn er een aantal zwarte mensen die nu door de overheid gefinancierde instellingen die ze leiden. En van top tot de bottom. En dat was vroeger niet en dat is nu wel. So he said, thank God there are spaces now that are actually led by people of color from top to bottom. But do they have that vibration that we're talking about? Sorry? Do they have that vibration? Uh, niet overal. Not Ik bedoel, everywhere. het Theater Rotterdam, Schouwburg Rotterdam, is anders dan als yeah. Lantaarn Finster, is anders dan Ita, is anders dan uh, uh, Belmo Park Theater. Yes, yes. Of een, een, een nu wordt, nou, voorbeelden. Yes, so he's saying uh, it's different because there are different, different spaces. So the theater behind us, different. The ones in Amsterdam, different. Yeah. Yeah. Jolanda? Um, when when some it, it's how it's how things are perceived if we're talking about certain uh, spaces places theaters uh, some most of them in Holland are perceived uh, as white and we kind of never talk about that they are white in foundation but as soon as we uh, say a space is perceived as feels like somebody said it feel oh you also said that uh, a, a home away from home when you feel at home like like you're saying so even even spaces that are now not perceived as black can become such uh, as soon as people show up as projects change as the vibration changes so we have to ask ourselves how how are we perceived by people and are we feeling that things i feel for example tr is changing uh, into that it will not be from one day to the next but it is changing in how it's perceived uh, by, by people um, yeah that okay. here Thanks. Um, for me, most that what comes up based on what you say and what you ask for, it's initiatives like Queer Saver Spaces, which is founded by uh, Ro, Mona, Ruena, which do things um, in, in, yes, in spaces that are white owned. But when I go there, it always feels like home away from home. Or the night shop here in Rotterdam um, in the West, if I look around at the people that are here, a lot of the people that curate these kind of spaces are here in this space as well, which for me, made me feel so safe knowing that there's people out there that are creating that and, and being gatekeepers in that sense. Maybe we should just buy something, yo. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, something I was thinking about, Jonathan, is how the National Black Theater is not a copy of anything. <laughs> it's a woman that had a vision that wanted to create something and build something. <laughs> um, would, you, would you agree with that? And so what, I, I, yeah. what makes the National Black Theater the National Black Theater? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, so I, I, I joke about it, but it's actually very true. After I leave this gig, I probably won't work at any other institution. Because um, I don't know of another space that will give me as much autonomy um, and as much freedom and as much uh, ability um, in the world. I think that I will have to figure, like I say, I jokingly say I'll become a florist or I'll make spiritual beads, right? Mm -hmm. These are the things that I do on the side and that will be my job. Because um, um, I don't want to work within a white institution. Why? Um, I don't want them to have my brilliance. Um, I don't want to have to question my autonomy um, or question my love of self. Um, I don't want to have a conversation with my lack. And I don't want to feel like when I sleep at night 
that I am helping to sustain a um, image of their likeness um, that has actually, for me, in America, um, and think about the white institutions in America, that are built off my backs. Um, and having them feel like they're appreciated because of it. Because my likeness, me being there, I know, what my, I know the value of what it means to have a Jonathan McCory inside of your institution. Um, I know what it means now more so than ever because of the way in which I have cultivated my, my personhood, um, the language which I bring to space. And I wanna make sure that it's always going back to the people. Um, so it's a, it's a, I, have, I have this existential crisis, actually, because I will be leaving National Black Theater. At some point, and become a florist. Yeah. 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 Because I have to, right? I didn't build, I, I'm not built, I mean, if you, if you look, if you go to the next, if you have the slide around the new building. <laughs> not yet, but no, oh, okay. I actually have slide and saw some work that you guys have yeah, created. Yeah, that's that called Skin Folk. That's yes. our musical that we did. Okay, tell us a little bit about it. That, that was the last show that we did before the pandemic. Okay. So it was a it was a it was a co-production at Bushwick Star. Um, uh, 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 we we had begun this process of creating something called MBT Beyond Walls, um, and we are the property that Dr. Tier bought. We are we have now leveled, and we're building a 20-story high-rise. Um, it's a um, it's an ambitious project. Really quick, leveled as in it is it, no it's no more. It is no the more. Building is gone. It's right gravel now. right if now. If you walk by, it's gone. It's, it's actually quite painful when you walk by, Jonathan. <laughs> I walked by the building, no building. I walked on the block two week, a few weeks ago, and it's it's painful to see that that building is no more. Well, I don't walk at, by there at all. <laughs> um, I mean, because you were also there when we were stripping everything down. Yeah, and I helped, so. You helped, you, you, you helped box, boxed. We, had, we, we boxed, uh, for our archival project, we boxed uh, 185 boxes yes. of material, assets, programs, historical documents, um, and the statues got boxed up too. And remember when I, the first box that I opened, I opened up and it was all the shows that I produced. Y that's very true. That ha only happens at the National Black That Day. only happens, that spirit, that yeah. spirit saying you're here where you need to be. Yeah. You're here where you need to be. I mean, I mean the, the, mus the, beautiful, the beautiful thing about National Black Theater is that it draws you in when you're supposed to be drawn in and then it says that this is your home. And that what I also love about some of what our residents say is that MBT is not about building an empire, it's about building a home. Those are two right. separate things. That, that, like, that like, it could be the biggest home it wants to be, but it's not gonna be the biggest empire. Right. Um, and we have institutions that build empires and we know what that feels like. I think many of us could probably name empire building that has happened in the theatrical or cultural sector. And then we have places that build homes. And that's a different, that's a different kind of vibration. Um, and so I try to live up to the space of building a home. Um, oh, what else? Oh, that's uh, Sweet. So that's another show um, that we did. It was by Harris and David Rivers. Um, that was actually in our space. So that wasn't outside of our space. So I was talking about MBT Beyond Walls. So um, what we had done um, in the wake of us tearing down the building is that we started thinking about this notion of National Black Theater as an idea versus a built space. Um, and what does it mean to share the idea of National Black Theater and not necessarily be confined by the brick and mortar of MBT? Um, and the invitation was to actually take what we have cultivated for the past 50 years and share it locally, nationally, and internationally. So that's where MBT Beyond Walls was birthed. It was birthed out of the concept of what does it mean to open up this prism that we have actually cultivated and actually illuminate it to not be confined by the by the location of 125th Street and 5th Avenue, but share it. So we went to Bushwick Star, we've gone to um, St. Louis Rep, we've helped to build the National Black Theater of Sweden, we've helped to, we've done um, St. Louis Rep, we've done McCarter, we've done stuff, at the, we're doing stuff at the public theater right now. Hold, okay. freeze, okay, that was my next question. The public theater. I wanted to ask a question about collaborating and who you choose to collaborate with. Yes. And um, Great question. A, a few weeks ago, I visited the public theater. I came to see the show Fat Ham, Fat which Ham. is a great, beautiful play and adaptation of Hamlet, but it's a black cookout. It's actually a really amazing show. Just won a Pulitzer Prize. It won the Pulitzer Prize this right. year. And you, you watch the play, and it's black joy on steroids. 
is how I felt when I walked out of the show. You know what's actually really kind of a, a, a phenomenal about it being getting the Pulitzer is that I think you might have heard me say this around the player residency program. I always wanted to not just produce the next Pulitzer winning play, but help to develop the Pulitzer winning artists. And we helped to support James Imes with his first New York production eight years ago, which gave him the freedom and the liberation to like be a known playwright in the New York City sector. It was with Kill Move Paradise, and it was through that show that he also met the director that he now is partnered with, like is his, like, his collaborating partner for like life, Sahim Ali. So like, it's like, it's like, and then for him to, for the next play that we produce of his, for it to be the one that he wins a Pulitzer for, it was just like, damn, Full language circle. is powerful. Yes. It is. Language is such a witchery tool. And then uh, National Black Theater goes beyond walls and start a collaboration with the public theater, which the public theater you can kind of compare to uh, Te Air or, well, let's say uh, Pri Alida, who's now the artistic director of Te Air, who you just met. Oh, yeah. Pri, before Alida was there, that's kind of the public theater. Wow, Known for you got a lot of work to do. I see. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. Known for Shakespeare in the Park. Every summer there's Shakespeare in the Park and they have amazing shows, but it also has a history of exclusion. Yeah. It also has a history of not really programming anything uh, uh, from artists of color. Yes. Um, where's the public, na public theater now? And why did you, how did you choose to work with an institution like the public theater and still, still hold on to the values of the National, National Black, Black Theater. Theater. So I have to give a lot of love and credence to Sahim Ali, who is the director of Fat Ham. Um, he, got, he got anointed as the, uh, much deserved, but he got anointed as the director in residence at the Public Theater and also the um, artistic associate at the Public Theater. Um, and when he got the opportunity to, f to produce his first show indoors at the Public, he said, I want to bring my family back together. So we were his first um, theater to give him a major production um, and basically give him the keys to whatever dream he might want to imagine. And we, pr and we produced Kimu Paradise, which was his opportunity to meet James Imes, which he considers to be his collaborative partner for life. Um, and so he wanted to bring everyone back to the watering hole to help to produce a show. And so we were in process of thinking about a remount of Kimu Paradise. And then when we tried to figure it out during COVID and everything, that didn't feel like the best thing that was responsive to our time. Um, Kimu Paradise was about set, uh, four, five black young men um, who were murdered by the cops, who were stuck in purgatory, um, trying to figure out their way to get to heaven. Um, and we just didn't feel like that was the best thing to do after everything we'd gone through. Like it felt kind of redactive and kind of felt like we were doing trauma porn and then like, you know what I mean? Like, not trying to do that, right? When, it, when we produced it, it was fine. It was what it needed, right? Um, at some point, you have, to be, you have to listen to say, is this really now? Um, and so uh, James gave us this other play called Fat Ham, um, which is a spinoff of Hamlet, as Ira has talked about, um, with centering a black family. But Hamlet is now a black, queer, queer, undefined, um, like a big guy, like rotund, fat guy, just trying to navigate the world. Um, trying to figure out after the death of his father and everything. And the beautiful thing about Fat Ham is that if you don't know Hamlet, you still can fall in love with it. And if you know Hamlet, then you're just like, oh, this guy's kind of smart. This is actually a really smart piece of theater. But if you don't know Hamlet, you're just like, oh, I'm just laughing at my auntie, my uncle, just eating some fried chicken, like eating the barbecue, trying to make some pig, like, oh, oh, the coleslaw? Oh, I love the coleslaw. Like, like it's just the rhythm of it is of that vibration of home, or what we've kind of talked about. It brings it back to, it brings the cadence of home into any built space. Um, and, and what I will say is that uh, because of Sahim Ali, and I will also say thank you to Oscar Hustis, who gave Sahim the, op uh, gave the freedom to make those choices. Oscar Hustis is the artistic director of the public theater. He's been there for I th Ever. forever, um, and, and he runs it. It's his baby. It is his, it is his, it is his, uh, what, his, 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 child, man, his yeah. child. And so, and so um, what I will give credence to Oscar is that he allowed for us to challenge him in how he did produces. Um, this is probably, as the public will say internally, they, uh, the first production where they're actually truly co-producing with the entity versus just presenting another entity. They co-produce with 
enhancement producers. They co-produce with all these other folks. They never really co-produce with another organization. Um, and if you do see them co-producing and billing, it's more so that they're pre they're presenting their concept and ideas, but they're not truly like like we want it. We want buy-in. We want to put money at the table, and we wanted box office. We said, I was, I was, I was like, you're, I, I, yes, you might have, you might have the budget to do this 100 to 100 percent and make and make this like 1.2 million dollar production be all yours. But like, I want a piece of this. Right. I, if we're actually gonna call this a co-production, then I need a piece of this pie, and you need to make space for my 100 percent, which might be a hundred thousand dollars, but that's my 100 percent, and I need my 100 percent not to look like a one-to-one -one match, so I only get like. 10% or 9% in the box office, actually my 100% because it's my 100 to be treated like 12% or even 15% so that, so that I get more, more on the back end of the box office um, because I'm doing the best I can with my 100 while you have an operating budget of, their operating budget is $95 million. So, like, so there's no way that I'm gonna ever be at your 100%, right? There might be one day, but right now, I know my limits, right? But I also know that I'm giving you the best I can. So if we're gonna talk about equity, parity, and all those great, lovely, big ADI words, let's live it. Let's actually truly live it. So I ask you to live those words and actually create a structure that invites me in holistically and doesn't pigeon me to be something else. So, so, so I give credence for Oscar for actually listening to that conversation, welcoming that conversation, and then actually making change. Because if he didn't want it, it wouldn't have happened. And he did. So, so we, have this, we, we have this true co-production happening that is extended three times. So it extended all the way up to July 17th. Um, we've, we, we've, been able, we've been able to truly, um, it's, it, 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 it was sold out during previews. It's like this weird, it's like this weird mechanism. You know when you do a show, like you love all your babies, but then one baby just has this like, like this like stellar moment. You're just like, what the fuck happened? Like, like the ancestors, the everything just came around that little baby and said, we're gonna make sure this one never breaks. <laughs> it ain't never gonna know nothing but success you gonna go far with this one now. <laughs> now you just, you just hold on your horses cause we about to take you up this big escalator and drop you, but you ain't gonna fall, like hit the ground. You gonna hit like a pillow. Like it gonna feel real good. All the, like, 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 like shit happens. Like people get COVID, but because I'm at the public, another actor disappears and they're killing it. I'm just like, where did you come from? What rehearsal did you come from out of? And it's just like over and over and over again, like stones are hit at it, like with every other show, but it just doesn't seem to break. And it keeps on providing a condition, like, like, like every show needs, to, need, needs moments of evolution and evolve, but it keeps on providing a condition for an audience member to know joy as, as synonymous with their next breath, right? Like after two years, three years of being in a pandemic and like, especially in my community in Harlem, a siren becoming synonymous with a bird chirping, and you realizing and knowing that that's connected to COVID or someone's dying or someone's gotten, sh or it's X, Y, and Z, because now crime is up high in Harlem. To have, to be in a room for 90 minutes and just laugh and be in a room for 90 minutes and see yourself being witnessed and being a witness to your own culture and be a witness to your own love and not being brought into a, a trauma-filled space as some of the plays now are doing, like they're bringing us into trauma versus bringing us into joy. I think I think I think I, I dispel all my notes. Right. Uh, every anything that I think could have happened differently doesn't matter anymore because I'm because the work is serving its purpose from a, so, from a spiritual cleansing space so that those people and the people who have seen it can now be a champion of their own joy in a different kind of way. Right. Yeah, exactly. Did I answer the question? Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, Wait, when are you gonna show the new I building? Oh yeah, show the new. So I was. We have oh, that's Kimu Paradise. So the beautiful thing about Kimu. Pa oh, yeah. no, okay. We can go back. Kimu the, Paradise. The beautiful thing about Kimu Paradise that was the show that brought James Ives and Sahim together. That it was a basically a hallway um, about the size. If you added another length to hear a hallway of two-way mirrors on a ramp with Marley with um, moving doors. And basically, it, it looked like a big microwave, if you actually wanted to know. But like, but like it, was, it was their interpretation of reflection being a part of um, purgatory. In purgatory, you reflect, so everything was reflective, and the five guys had to reflect on their past and their present, while we as the audience members got to view into their, their reflection, and we got cut off at different moments because it was ramped up. Like perspective, you don't always get to see everything, you only get to see what you need to see, so yeah. 
And then that was uh, Dominique Russo. That was one of the first shows, a part of my season, um, part of when I, when I got to MBT, Detroit 67. And then that was an outdoor piece called 125th and Freedom. The magical part about 125th and Freedom that it was a five hour durational piece that um, went across 125th Street in total. It was an ensemble of 20 people. We, we went to 16 different sites and popped up art in 16 different sites telling the story of black liberation. The premise of it was it was created by a beautiful artist by the name of Ebony Well Golden. What was that if Harriet Tubman was alive today, how would she free her black people? And how would she take us on a freedom journey if she could witness what we see now happening in Harlem? What would the conversation look like and how would we get liberated from it? That's the new building. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I would like to have the apartment right there to the right <laughs> with the trees when we talk about ownership. <laughs> how do you see, even though you just talked about this is not gonna be your forever gig. Yes. How, what do you see for the future for NBT? I mean, my, A, this is, this is uh, designed by a Mexican Chilean architect by the name of Frida Escovedo. This is her first time um, ever designing in New York City. Um, and um, we got her first, we, quote unquote, we were able to work with her first. She's now working with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So she has two buildings that will be going up on Fifth Avenue. So we're her first. The second one would be the Metropolitan, um, and um, and what I what I have to say about this is that also there's this. This is exactly kind of what we wanted to to a degree. Um, Shade Lithcott, the CEO of MBT, would say, "I I want what we do, but better, right? I want what we." Oh, there we go. That's Sade. So I want, I want, I want what I want. I want to do what we do, but better, more resourced, um, with more abundance. And so, and so, the building that we're cultivating is the building of the future for black for black theater. It's the building of the future for autonomy. We will still own the space that we occupy. We will be, um, we will be occupying five floors of this twenty-story building. Um, we will have two full floors in that in in, the, in those five floors. We will have a shop in that space so we can build construct our own sets, but also train people to build and um, do their own sets. We'll have a rehearsal studio. There will be a recording booth so that people can record voiceovers, do whatever kind of thing. Um, and I think what also is really important about the space is that it's doing, it is uh, going to have. Um, so on this corner right over here, so over there where there is no windows, that will be our studio theater, which one might call Black Box Theater. Um, on this side, there will be this octagon templed space. So Dr. Barbara Antier worked with a Haitian architect, um, also studied uh, the molecular structure of water um, from, a, from a Japanese study, um, where they basically said how you name water, it, it shifts based on how you name it how you speak to it, how you cultivate it, it shifts, it changes, it grows. So the crystals of the water respond to language. And so, they, so, so she wanted to create a temple of liberation. And so she, with the, with the Haitian architect, created this octagonal space that is uh, 3,000 3, square feet um, that um, is oct octagon and then templed at 36 feet in the air. So it creates this kind of dome shape. And the notion is that the body, the human body, if it sits down, if, it, if, you, if you were to stand in the center of the octagon and speak to it, so if you were to speak your own healing, your own words, whatever, it would bounce the words back to you so that you understand that you are part of your healing, you're not just healing others. So it helps to reverberate um, the juju mm. um, and allow the juju to cultivate itself inside of this womb like space and what she ultimately wanted that space to be was a space for um, for uh, immersive 3d hologram uh, theater to happen in um, when she tried to do when she tried to price it out with Disney, it was gonna be a million dollars a minute in order to be able to do it, so at that moment we weren't able to do that. But we, what we are gonna do is that we're re-establishing in the new construction, we're re-establishing the Temple of Liberation, and what we're doing is that we're gonna create it so it could be an immersive womb, so we're adding projection, um, uh, uh, 3D mapping, and kind of um, responsive um, technology to it so that we can, we have our first, we just got our first commission artist, which would be Nona Hendrix, to basically tell, tell, a, tell a story, a narrative that is guided by black bodies. If, you, if, you, if you've experienced it, um, the Van Gogh exhibition, it's really big in um, the States right now, but it's basically this uh, immersive storytelling of Van Gogh's work activate it in real, in real time. So we're asking her to do that equivalent for a black story narrative. 
um, so that we can um, we can begin starting to like have black bodies participate in that billion dollar business. Beautiful. And when is it set to open? Um, so we just got as of Friday on the heels of Dr. Tier's birthday and on Juneteenth, we just got all the financing for the full building. Um, so, um, so starting, so it will be 26 month construction. Awesome, great. So one more question and then I wanna open it up to the audience, uh, specifically in this climate that we're in right now. Black artists are the, t the trend for many white institutions. A lot of us are getting calls to come and sit at the table. Um, I want you to speak a little bit on what you think our responsibility is as artists as we put our work out in the world and what, in whatever space it is that you're doing it in. What do you think is our, the, our most imperative uh, responsibility at this moment? I think it's really important for every black body to see themselves in the future um, and the future that they want to be a participant of. Um, and that means what labor do you want to do and what labor do you not want to do? Um, uh, these institutions, these opportunities are full of labor. Um, and the question and the quest is how, how much can the body, can your body hold um, as a consistent contributor and production of work? Um, black bodies, I see it from black artists in particular, they're being taxed with a kind of um, uh, machine, like producing machine that is actually depleting their, their own knowingness and lovingness of themselves. Um, and they're producing, and what they're producing now is half the quality of what it could have been if they were able to say no. The power of your no is actually more important than the power of your yes in this moment. Um, and the more and more you can lean into, the more, the, more, the more and more you can cultivate the signature no, you actually open up the gateway to the, your profound yes. Um, you're not meant to do everything. You're not meant to, you are not meant to actually save the world. That's a collective doing. That's not a singular doing. Um, and if you hold the mantle that you are here to save the world, you will undo your own, your own self. You might save the world, but did you save yourself? Um, and, so, and so I ask that question. Um, we've had too many examples of people trying to save the world. I think of Mahatma Gandhi. I think of um, Mother Teresa. I think of I think of um, I think of um, Malcolm X. I think of Martin Luther King. I think of um, uh, uh, I think of Mary Makiba. People who have held the, down. I need to save the world through my doing this. And did they save themselves in that doing? I think of Dr. Barbara Intier. Did, this, did, did, did she have to go the way that she went? It was an untimely death. Did, did that have to happen? If she was holistically, if every one of them were holistically seeing that they weren't meant, no one is meant to save the world. There, it's a collective decision. It is about saving oneself. And that is not a selfish thing. That is the most generous thing you possibly could give to your community. Because if I walk in saved, I then show up as an example of what salvation can look like. And by walking, walking around as a vessel of salvation, then I then I get to experience a communal salvation that then is it like it becomes a light match because people want to know joy. They want to experience joy. Capitalism tells us to take joy and not experience it. And I think that we, we built leadership based off the model of taking. I take, I take, I take from you. I take from this black artist. I take your indigeneity. I take your uniqueness. And your indigeneity is not necessarily um, your cultural roots. It is your, it is your unique expression of self. Mm. When I say indigeneity, I mean like, what is that unique expression of self that no one else has? Like, like my friend, um, Belinda, she, she, uh, I was like talking to her one day. I was just like, I'll be wearing some wild ass clothes. And people be like, ooh, you rocking it real nice. And but there was a time when I wasn't rocking it so nice. And so, and so like, and so like, it, it is a question, it's a question of, I started to own myself. And by owning myself, I could wear the, wear the, wear the jumpsuit with the weird, like the, I could wear all the wild, goofy, whatever, which singularly might look weird, right? But collectively, because of my body, my vessel, the way I decide to own it, shows up as unique expression. That's my unique expression of self. That is my indigeneity. And so what's your hope for black artists, for us? 
I hope, I, ho I, hope, I hope that we all understand that we are diamonds in the making. And I'll go, because I've been wanting, I wanted to, I wanted to share, I wanted to share this when I talked about DC and the diamond aspect. Um, and when I mean diamonds in the making, it means that we have to accept what it means to be a part of the diamond making process. One, that means that we have to know that pressure is not, um, pressure is needed. So if we all love diamonds and we're all like, ooh, I want a diamond, or ooh, I love wearing diamonds, like, right, all those things, and like, ooh, when the light goes through the diamond, I love it when it makes that prism, like, I wanna know that prism. Um, there are some things that we also have to accept when we say we want that. Um, that means that we have to understand that pressure is a part of it, um, that there is a tearing that will, that will cultivate, that this is a marathon, not a sprint race. Um, that we are part of a collective sentence. We are not the full sentence. We might not even see the full sentence being manifested. Um, that, 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 we, that we are precious in every way that we do, but we are resilient in everything that we are. Um, and that if we stay true to that, um, in that diamond making process, hmm, if we stay true to that, we then cultivate the most profound life that we possibly can imagine. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to open it up to the audience for a few questions. Ida. <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jonathan, for your story. Um, I was just looking at this building, and the first thing I was thinking, what would Dr. Tier say about this building? And um, you just talked about her death also, but, um, and how unfortunate that was, but and you also talked about black people being able to see themselves in the future, and I feel like she had that, Absolutely. because I wonder, she was able to have this imagination about herself and her people. Ashe. So what do you think that she would say when she would see this building? That's a really beautiful question. Um, I honestly think that she would, she would say, I left at the right time. Shade and I talk about how the Harlem that we now live in, the society we now live in, she wouldn't have been able to really code switch and neither should she had to, right? But she wouldn't have been able to code switch the way that Sade, myself, and, her, and, and Michael, her brother, who's our board chair, have been able to. Um, there's a malleability to us that has allowed us to truly meet, the, meet this, co this, 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 this way in which you have to deal with billion dollar developers who are white, identified, and be able to help them to understand how this is an act of reclamation for their, for their historical buy-in based off of the race in which they are a part of, um, the society in which they are a part of. Um, and I think, I think, the first thing that comes to my mind that she would be, I think that she is happy, because I'll just tell you this, and this is how you know she's happy, every major moment has, cons has, has, has been in conversation with her birthday. The moment that we signed and pinned the development deal for the new building, was Sade and Michael, her son and her daughter, signed it on her birthday. It got ratified by the developer on Juneteenth, which is considered the last day that people, uh, black people in America got to, like in Texas, learn of the of Emancipation Proclamation, so knew that they were free. So to us, that was like, she's happy, right? The day that this building gets fully capitalized and can now start digging into the ground because it has all the money it needs, it's on, the, it's on her birthday. So like there's just this reminder on a consistent basis that spiritually she's holding this, this project in the highest of heights and that she's happy. Um, there's, a, there's, also, there's also something, so, so like physically she might, and this is where I learned that death is only a transition, that spiritually she's so present, but physically she's not here. Um, that's even like with my grandmother and my dad I feel their presence ever so more palpably than I ever could when they were physically tethered to bodies that would allow for them to access their life. And so on some level, I celebrate their, their transition. I celebrate her transition because it gave the freedom for this idea to show up. I don't think this idea would have shown up in this way, it would have shown up in a different way, but not in this way if she was still around. I don't think that I would be talking to you right now in this way if she was still around. 
because there, kind of there was a kind of a grief that she held because of the witnessing that she had to uphold that actually conditioned her to have a relationship to life that, is, that, that, that would not have welcomed as freely a being like me. Does that make sense? Ooh, um, powerful words. Thank you so much for what you shared today. I had a question about intentional leadership. Um, one of the things that I'm completely just blown away by is the beauty of the next generation that comes after. Sometimes parents build things and their children destroy them. <laughs> and so <laughs> they do, not on purpose. It just, they just they don't understand the gift that they have. And it seems that with Sade and you, you all understand the gift that this, that this is and you've been able to continue it. Can you share a little bit about, uh, you know, just what it's like, you know, maybe for Sade, like, is there pressure? Because oh, no, no, it's beyond yeah. pressure. How does she manage that? How do you manage that knowing that this, this is such a big gift that you all are sort of responsible for? I mean, this is, this is the gift that Sade got, and she didn't understand it until three years after her mother's transition. She got a poem handwritten by Maya Angelou in response to her mother's transition. So that's the kind of woman that we're talking about. Maya Angelou writes a, a new poem for you to have as a testimony to your mother, right? So like, and, and Maya Angelou said, and it taunted Sade until she really earned the words, don't ever try to walk into your mother's shoes. It's done. What she did will never be able to happen. And Sade said, oh, that's imposter syndrome. I'll never be able to be like, like first went to little me. Then the big me started saying, oh, now I get to go wherever I want to go because she laid the foundation. Right? The big me of the wisdom of what, of what her auntie, Maya Angelou, was saying to her was that you never have to go back to what your mother started. You get to use your mother's foundation as a launch pad to now be whoever you want to be. And what freedom comes by knowing that the diamond has been set. And I think that that is, that, 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 that is, and, and I think that Sade, myself, and Michael, her son, made a pact but that's, in particular, Sade and I did when I first came on, which was that this would not be the Sade Lithcott show or the Jonathan McCory show. I didn't start directing until almost six years in. I was creating space because I knew of the sacred IP of National Black Theater. There's no, I knew it to be nowhere else in the world. And it was because it was in New York, it was uniquely positioned and that it could launch careers. It was, a, it was a launching pad. And my career didn't need to be set because this was my brain, I'm 25. In three years, if I don't do well, I'll go to MFA school. Who gives a fuck? Like, you know what I mean? Like, like in three years, I get to go somewhere else, right? But in three years, I also get to make transformation. And by, and, and by being a generous leader, I also create conditions for me to learn what it means to actually be an artistic director. Because I do not think an artistic director is a person who puts themselves on. I believe, for myself, that's, me, that's my constitution, I believe artistic director is a person who puts other people on. I create the space. I don't, dim, I don't dominate the space. So, 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 so a part of, a part, a part, a part of what, what you're witnessing, which I appreciate you saying that because I didn't actually talk about our co-leadership model that Shade and I have. We're both co-leaders. So like we undulate in our leadership. Like I'm in real estate, she's in artistic. Sometimes it gets crunchy, but we try to figure it out, right? Like how we both undulate back and forth between I'm in her domain, she in my domain, and like how it works. But I will say the profound gift of it is that that friction creates the diamond. It's uncomfortable. It's like when I like I, I've been going I've been going to I've been going with a personal trainer for five months only because I was I was afraid I was going to have a grief body because both of two anchors in my life transition. So I was like I have too much going on to get stuck physically, so I need a personal trainer to get me out of that stuckness. So I would go three days a week for an hour. It was a weird, it was a 5, 5 a.m., go for an hour, get my workout on so that I could get this grief out of my body or start to process this grief within my body, right? With my personal trainer. And what I've learned is that the, te the tearing of my muscle, the tearing of, the tearing of muscles that have to happen that cause a soreness, call X, Y, and Z, is a healthy way of being. 
We're not like like the idea of discomfort, the idea of, of that uncomfortability having to show up. So why do I say all that? I say all that to say that in leadership, in our co-leadership, that tearing is consistently happening. That's completely uncomfortable. But it's also creating a stronger bond and a stronger and a stronger linkage between the two of us. I also say all I, I say all that um, to equally say that a building like that will tear someone down. It will tear a leader, a, a partnership up easily because you're you're having to raise millions that you've never known you're having to rate you're having to talk to people who will totally say i want a singular leader who is the singular voice who does this because i want to talk to them and you're having to say no there's more than that and you're also having not to be gaslit yourself because there is a there is an anointing on both of our lives if you were to meet Sade, you will be just as anointed as if you saw me. But if you see both of us, you're just like, you're just like, oh, wow. But if you saw one of us, you're just like, great. I just need one of you. Who's the one? But that's not how we were destined. That's not how our quilt was destined to be woven together. And we've had to do the self-work, a lot of self-work. I mean, like, I've gone to, like, four or five personal development spiritual retreats. In order to have the body that you are, the spirit and the mind and the and the heart that you get to witness right now, because I'm having to do that in order to be in order in order to actually show up for Dr. Tier actually show up for Sade and show up for my community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one out of 10 people has a disability. Uh, black people maybe more if you look at the Netherlands. Um, if you look at inclusion and the progress that we're making as a black community, we're mainly talking about women's rights, uh, LHBTQ plus communities, and not as, much as um, not as much for people with disabilities. We also don't see them in these spaces. Uh, how is that for the National Black Theater? How do you see that progression? And how do you organize radical progression Ashe. and inclusion for people with, black people with disabilities? I, I, I love that that's our last question because it's, it's one of the most important questions that need to be on everyone's lips um, because that is, an, uh, that is a community that gets erased and they actually don't feel a part of the black community, they just feel a part of the disabled community. Um, and uh, MBT found that out firsthand. So we did, we did a, so A, we're not perfect at it. There's a lot that needs to be changed about what we, how we do. I'm not gonna sit up here and say like, ah, we're the best at, at, at creating space for black disabled um, and deaf and blind folks. Um, I, will, I, will, I will say that we do, we're doing the best that we can and our awareness is keenly focused on how to do it, how to do it um, with as much heart and holistic as possible. Um, one is that Sade and I publicly, publicly talk about our disabilities as two people with mental disabilities, education disabilities, so that it is made clear that, 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 we're, that even though our disabilities might be blind, we are not trying to hide where that where who we are or trying to hide disability at all. Um, two is that in our programming, we had a we, we did a programming based off Mozart um, and Mozart, as people may know, went, went deaf in one ear. And there was a journal. There's a journal that's in the um, New York Public Library that basically marks the year in which he went deaf. And in that journal, he talks about losing his hear, hear side. Da, da, da. And we had this we had this process of micro commissions where we take historical text and we give it to black artists to reimagine. And for that micro commission, we basically picked all deaf, disabled, and blind artists, black artists, to come in and reimagine his journal entries. And we brought a, a deaf choreographer, we brought, um, we brought a deaf choreographer, a physically disabled, um, physically disabled choreographer as well, musicians, X, Y, and Z, blind, like all the spectrum. Um, and what that taught us and I also, I also have to say that in our playwright residency program, because we, we have a three-prong residency program for playwrights, directors, and producers, for our playwright residency program, we have a playwright who has MS, who um, it's only supposed to be an 18-month program, but because of her MS, she needs more time. And so and it's like she was antsy about it. She was like, I'm not going to be able to meet. And like she felt shame. And I was like, there's no shame. Take the time that you need. 
So if you need, if you need, she's now been with us for three years, then you're, you're home for three years. That's what that means. And if you're here for five years, you're home for five years. And that means that we have to raise more money to give you more funds to make sure that you show up. That's just what it means. So I think, I, I think, I think what MBT is committed to is that if there's an artist in our midst that's a part of our ecosystem, we do whatever we can not to shame them for the, for, for the vessel that they are. We try to create the resources so their vessel does show up. I will say that we are, what we do need to do, and I think in this new building, we are doing it in a lot of ways in built space. Like We're trying to make sure that it's as accessible as possible. We're trying to make sure that the water, like, from the water fountain to the toilet, to like, like thinking, about, thinking about gender expression, thinking about non-gender expression, thinking about um, um, who won't be able to come to seat or sit or experience or go up to that loja. Like how do we, how do we create as many conditions as possible so that it, is, it does become a home away from home for black IP? Um, I, I, will say, I will say there will always be a blind spot. We will always have it um, because we're not perfect. Um, but we will be divine in our in our process. Um, I hope I'm answering the question. Um, I think I think I think that I think that I, I would I would leave by saying if you're not willing to make a mistake, then you're not willing to actually have a conversation with progress. And if the person who feels the the bristle of your mistake is not willing to listen from a space of how can I be a vessel not to teach but to holistically evolve the conversation, then you're having a divisive, like we fear making a mistake so much that we'd rather just be right. And our rightness creates oppression. And I, am, and I would welcome any leader who is having a conversation with that very sensibility of like, who have I left out of the conversation? It's like how, not how can I intentionally be wrong? How can I invite myself into a conversation of this might sting and I invite the right people, as many people as I can, again, going to the durational process, the marathon race versus the sprint of building in what does it mean to make a more equitable space for humans to show up, not labels. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. No, you're not. One more thing. I want you to close out the space. Jonathan has this thing at the National Black Theater. After every show, after every conversation, he closes out the space with a unifying breath. So Jonathan, take it away. All right, so, um, so the unifying breath uh, uh, is something that we do at MBT. It really helps to ground and basically honor that this was a unique space and time that would never happen again. So if everyone, if you can, and how you're able, put your two feet flat on the ground, connecting yourself to Mother Earth and to the vibration of this grass, vibration of life that's underneath your feet, the molecules, the, mecha the, me the mechanism of that life, and then allowing the energy from your crown, the royal, the abundant you, to drop through the crown of your head and land into the center of your system. We're just gonna take a unifying breath and I'm gonna give you a little bit around my technology that I know so far around breath so that we're all on the same page. Breath is a very important thing. Breath is a thing that allows for this instrument, this vessel, this gift, this machine to operate. Breath woke you up this morning. So with that, we're gonna take a unifying breath. Knowing that the space and time which you're able to occupy will never happen again. This sacred algorithm and you in these very spaces will never happen again. And for those who weren't here, it will never happen this way again. So with that, we're gonna take a unifying breath. And we breathe in, and after we breathe in love, joy, affirmation, clarity, to bake and root into the center of our system. And that when we exhale, we actually exhale as a gift so that it wraps around everyone in this building, everyone in this room, so that we walk out as lighter, brighter, abundant human beings, able to do the work we were called on this planet to do. So the count of three, inhale in, exhale out, and enjoy the rest of your Saturday. On the count of three, one, two, Three, inhale, then exhale. Ashay. Ashay, thank you. Jonathan McCory, everybody. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you.